at First Assembly of God Church across from the fruit stand, Monroe Academy, in that neighborhood. If you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Tommy and his wife is going to get baptized. And I don't know, we've had a few more to come in. And, and uh, hopefully they've given their heart to the Lord, had several new ones come. But uh, that's something very serious to be thought about, baptism. It's just not a jump in the pool and dip off and wash the dirt off. The water has no power except for obedience to the word of God. He said that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So it's something that we need to do for obedience, but only the blood of Jesus can cleanse us from sin. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Thank you for standing in reference of reading God's word. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Boy, churches could be busting out walls if we had all those that started. That so don't keep laying again. Have to get saved every revival. Have to rededicate. No, 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 no offense. If you're a backslider, no offense. But if you could just get in there and stay in there. Amen. And, and quit having to lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works. And of faith towards God of the doctrines uh, of the doctrine of baptisms and and laying on of hands. I, I, that's where I'm going to pull my message from this morning. And the laying on of hands. I don't even want to finish reading that verse of scripture. I want to preach about hands this morning. And the laying on of hands. Somebody say that with me. And the laying on of hands. Stretch your hands forth this pulpit and pray for me today. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, God. I know that you're able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now, right now, God, I'm asking for your liberty in your house. The Bible said the Lord is that spirit where the spirit of the Lord at. There is liberty. I pray from the abundance of my heart and my mouth to speak. My heart may be filled with love. Lord, add into your church today. If there's a lost, lonely idol out there in the world and they're going through life without Christ, I pray this would be their last moment, their last day, their last second of being lost and undone. I pray that your son would knock on their heart's door. They'll open up and y'all will come in and suck with them and fellowship with whoever it may be, that the word of God will not return into you void, that it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you sin. I pray right now for a special anointing upon this service, that every devil in hell is bound up in the name of Jesus right now, that the spirit of the Lord is loose in this sanctuary, and we'll give you all praise for it being the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Somebody shout amen today. Amen. Give the Lord some praise for his word when you sit down. I want to preach upon the hands today. It was it was most important that the author, which is unknown, some may have thought it was Paul in the later in the later years, but it's never really been recorded who wrote the book of Hebrews. But the Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1 and 21, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So we know today that God is the author of the Bible. He may have used man's hands to pen the words of the scripture, but the Bible said he breathed on it. Amen. It became a living word. Not only is the word of God just a written word, but it's a living word. Hebrews 4 and 11 12 says, the word for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of a sunder of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and tents of the heart. I'm telling you right now that if you'll get you some some word inside of you can make mountains move as, as the song said you can do mighty things through the power of God and the Bible said that we should go on and not keep having to get saved every time you turn around we have revivals we have special services and oh it touches my heart when I see one that has left the Bible said Jesus would leave 99 and go after that one that has gone astray and it's such a blessing to see that one when he comes back to Jesus. But it's even more exciting when you see that one hold on to Jesus all through the storms and all through the test of time. How many knows that we can make it? The Bible said that he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. He said he came unto his own, but his own received him not. But as many as came to him, then he gave therefore power that they should become the sons of God. I come to tell you, I'm thankful for God's saving grace but above that I'm thankful for your sustaining grace that keeps me on the straight and narrow path yeah. it's not good enough to start this race 
We've got to finish it. And the Bible talks about the laying on of hands. You know, there's a lot of churches that doesn't practice this no more. But I think that's such bizarre. They, they, they put us in a category of our own and say only Pentecostals practice that. I believe anybody that is practicing biblical doctrine would practice the laying on of hands. It's too obvious in Scripture. The Bible teaches us in Mark 16, 17, and 18, and these signs shall follow the prophets. That ain't what it said. These signs shall follow the preachers. No, that ain't what it said. The Bible said that these signs shall follow them that believe. How many believe that Christ rose from the dead on the third day and sitting at the right hand? Come on, somebody. At the right hand of the Father. And he makes intercession. If you can catch that today, you're more powerful than you think you are. The Bible said greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. If the church could get stirred up today to know what type of power that Jesus Christ has left us, we can do mighty things for the glory of God and all glory goes to him. Amen. Mark 16, 17, 18 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands. They shall lay hands. They shall lay hands upon the sick. Come on, Bible readers, where you at? And they shall recover. I don't know about y'all, but when you pray, you need to put your hands on them and pray in the name of Jesus that the power of God could work through you. Amen. How many believe today that God wants to use you? Yeah. Amen. Whether you're a preacher, whether you just got saved, whether you're a deacon, well, no matter what you are, God wants to use you. I come to give you a news flash. God didn't save you to be a pew warmer. God didn't save you to clutter up the church. God said that you were laborers. He didn't just pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth people. See, that's what's wrong with churches nowadays. Churches are filling up with people, but they're lazy folk. Right. Oh, you ain't going to talk to me now. The churches are filled with lazy folks that don't want to work. First Thessalonians 4 and 11, and talking about hands. And the Bible said that you study to be quiet and to do your own business and work with your own hands. Glory be to God. Somebody take a look at their hands. God gave you those things to work. Uh-huh. Look at your hands. I'm talking about focus upon them for a second. Because your hand is unique. If you've ever thought about it, there's no other hand just like your hand. When the police gets after you, I don't care where you run, there's something on your hand that will lead them to you. It's not a chip. It's called a fingerprint. Amen. There's no other fingerprints on earth like your fingerprint. Psalm 139 and 14 says, And I will praise the world, Lord because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. God doesn't make junk. When he made you, he made you into the image of God. Now, what you did to your life is all on you. But when God made you, you were spotless. Come on, somebody. He said six days that he made the earth, and the seventh day he rested. And in that sixth day, he made man, and he looked upon his work and said, it is good. I come to tell you, when God does something, he does it right the first time. It's all right if God's hands on it. Praise God. The first thing that I think about is when I think about the hands or the hands of healing, they shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover. In Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is coming out of the mountain. They've been praying and a leper met Jesus. And these are the words that the leper said to Jesus. If thou wilt, thou can make me cleansed. Leprosy was, was no healing in those days. If you caught leprosy, the only thing that could happen with God would move or you die. It was just that simple. Leprosy is a symbol of sin. If Jesus don't wash your sins away, there's no hope for you. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. You don't know how blessed you are today to have a high priest which can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. He said in all ways he was like us, but he knew no sin. He is our interceder today, our mediator, the one, the bridge that got sinful man to a holy God. Put your hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords that made access that we could come boldly to the throne of grace whereby we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time.
time of need. And the Bible said in Matthew 8, 2 and 3 that Jesus put forth his hands and healed him. It's something about the laying on of hands that the author of Hebrews wants us to learn this morning. If you're saved today, you got something in your hands. Amen. I remember when God called Moses in the backside of the desert. Moses couldn't talk right. Moses was scared of the calling of ministry. They were scared of the calling of leadership. But he said, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses had no confidence in himself. Moses said, there's no way that I can tell a Pharaoh to let your people go. I don't, how, how many of you ever had to do something for the Lord and you had no confidence? Man, when I get up to this pulpit, I think to myself, God could have called a lot more preachers to do it better than I am. But a lot of times he uses our weakness to bring his son glory for out of weakness is his strength made perfect. Amen. If you're low in confidence today, lift up your head to the hills. You got a higher power that is for you. And if God be for you, who can be against you? The first thing you need to make sure you got God with you. Because if God ain't with you, it don't make no difference. Satan can blow on and it don't fall. The Bible said the foolish man built his house upon the sand. A lot of churches are building their house upon the sand. It's no offense to, to our, our youth or any other youth. Well, I'm thankful that we have games and entertainment that we can get kids involved in church. But the sad thing about it, 100 people will show up to play softball, but only 15 will show up for prayer meeting. I'm telling you, we're building a house upon the sand. Come on, somebody. If the only ministry we have is a softball game, if the only ministry we have is popcorn and hot dogs, we don't got no ministry. They say, Brother Brandon, you've got to get them in here. If the spirit don't draw them, they can't come to begin with. I go around and I look at bigger churches that are growing, and many of them filled with games. They say, Brother Brandon, we need some more entertainment. I think our youth leaders are doing everything in their power to keep our youth involved. But if they don't want to be involved, they ain't going to get involved. I don't care what kind of games you come up with. If the youth don't want to serve Jesus, they're not going to serve Jesus. If the parents don't make them come, they'll stay at the house. Don't get me started this morning. It's a crying shame when parents come and they... I mean, the children come in the parents' day. I guess I got to go there. The Lord won't leave me alone about it. We wonder where our future generation's at. I tell you where it's at. It's right now because our future, our, our future generation is alive. You see them right now. Amen. Too cold to come to church. Had to stay at home. Never too cold to go to Walmart. Too hot to go to church. Never too hot to go fishing. Come on. Come on. Too loud down there at church. Never too loud for the Alabama football game. Come on. I'm sick up to my neck in excuses that people use not to come to church. Why don't you just call Brother Brandon and say, I don't want to come to church today. Then you won't be lying. Amen. Is it okay to preach this this morning? Good. I'm going to preach it anyhow. Amen. The Bible says not to forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Oh, here you go. He done gone to meddle. Y'all, if we want to see a movie of God, I had a fellow tell me the other day that he was saved, but he didn't want to come to church. He had his own personal convictions why he didn't come to church. My Bible tells me in 1 Peter 4 and 17 that judgment must first start at the house of God. And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? I don't know about y'all, but I feel naked when I don't get to go to church. Amen? Amen. I'm going to go and leave that alone. Jesus put his hands forth and the leper was healed. Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 and 15. Oh, here we go with the flu. We all come talk about the flu today. I didn't come to talk about the flu. I come to talk about the flu healer. Amen? Amen. So many times we focus upon the problems and don't lift up Jesus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I draw all men unto me. Praise God. He said, the, the psalmist said, oh, come and let us magnify the Lord together. I can remember Sister Mary reading her Bible 
and, 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 and the words of the Bible were small about like mine. I'm getting about half blind myself, but I can remember her putting that big old magnifying glass up and closing one eye like she's sitting to shoot a shotgun. And I'd, look, I'd look at those magnifying glass, and that word would be that big. <laughs> on the other side, that magnifying glass, you'd have to cock that one eye just to see if it was on the page. But the thing about it is it didn't make the word no bigger. The word was still small. But when she magnified it, it made it look bigger to her. I wish I had somebody to come to church today and say I didn't come to magnify high blood pressure. I didn't come to magnify diabetes. I didn't come to magnify cancer. I didn't come to magnify the flu. I come to lift up the name of Jesus. Because if I can get a hold of him, all those other things are under his feet. Come on, give God some glory. Yeah. Mark chapter the, the Bible said Matthew I, I didn't finish state what I was stating. The Bible said that when Jesus was passing on his journey, that Peter's mother-in-law was laid sick in the bed with guess what? A fever. And the Bible said that when Jesus walked in, he didn't say, Ooh, she got the flu. Ooh, she got fever. I try to be good, but it don't ever work. I try to be nice, but there's a boldness that comes upon me when I get in the pulpit that says, preach the word, be answered in the season. I'll say, let it rip, tater chip. That's my, that's my version. That's BJV, Brandon James version, whatever you want to call it. And, 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 but Jesus did not bypass. Aren't you glad that when you were such a sinner that the world didn't want nothing to do with you, you were labeled as crackhead, drug addict, alcoholic, fornicator, shack up, lying, backbite, no good for nothing. But Jesus went out of his way to come down to your level where you're at, that he might lift you up to his. I wish I had somebody that could think back where you were and praise God for where you're at and also where you're going. Jesus has got a heart for the outcast. He said he'd leave 99 righteous to go after a sinner. Nowadays, we want to run them out for they get in church. We want to tell them how to live before they ever get saved. You can't wear this. You got to do that. You can't do this. You can't do Get them saved. God will lead them to all truth. If you'll get the Holy Ghost inside them, he'll lead them into all truth. foundation of salvation is being born again. Jesus said, lest a man be born again, he shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. What did Jesus do when he walked in where the fever was at? He went straight to the issue. Right. See, what's wrong with church people nowadays? They come into church living in sin and get mad to preach when he preaches them. I don't know why he judges me. County God can judge me. The Bible said, be sure your sin will find you out. I had them talk. I've, I've had them stop me at the door and say, Brother Brandon, was you spying on my house last night? I said, No, ma'am, I don't go to women's house looking in their windows being a peeping Tom. Come on. But I know God and God knows you. And if I get a hold of God, God will read your book like, Come on. Yeah. God will tell you where you at. But he loves you so much that if you allow him, he won't leave you where you're at. He'll bring you out of the miry clay, put your feet upon a solid rock. And the wise man built his house upon the rock. And when the winds and the floods came, great was the fall of the sand house. But those who built the house upon the rock, Jesus said, upon this rock will I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail. I feel good in the Lord this Sunday morning. I barely made it through the sermon last Sunday because of sickness, but I come to talk about this next Sunday, a healer. Yeah. You see, the devil will try to strike you with sickness sometimes to try to shake your faith to believe that God's a healer. But if you believe it, you believe it. If you don't, you don't. Amen. If you believe it, can't nothing stop you. Amen. If you believe it, can't nothing stop you. Jesus touched her and the fever left her. Mark chapter 5. Jesus is besought by a rich young ruler by the name of Jairus that comes and asks Jesus that my daughter's lying at home sick and I need you to come by and touch her. So Jesus left where he was going 
And I can just see right now Jairus' heart rate's getting up. His eyes are happy. He's anxious that finally his sick daughter would be soon be healed by Jesus. Maybe he didn't have enough of faith to pray it for his daughter, but he went after Jesus to pray for him. Amen. When we get in trouble and we don't have it, and we feel like we don't have it, the Bible says we have not for we ask not. If we don't have enough faith, don't act like you got enough faith. Just ask Jesus to help you. And he said, if we ask, we shall receive. Amen. But, but, but there's a problem. Because we're touching, we're talking about the hands that heal and how Jesus is touching people. But we have a problem because before he gets to Jairus, somebody presses through the crowd and touches him. He's going to touch somebody, but there's a lady that's been suffering for 12 years. You know, there's people in the church that quiet, try to quiet you down when you get happy and go to praising the Lord. But I dare you just to overlook them because if you can remember where you were at the day that you touched Jesus or Jesus touched you, they may not know your story. That's why they can't feel your glory. But if you'll begin to praise the Lord and get everybody else off of your mind, because I didn't come here to please you. I didn't come here to please them. I'm here to please the Lord. And if the Lord's pleased, that's all it is. Amen. And, and so she pressed through the crowd, the Bible says. You see, the Levitical law says that she's supposed to be ostracized and set apart from everyone. She's unclean. She's had a blood issue for 12 years. Somebody say the law said it. The law, the law. The law said that she can't leave home. The law said she can't touch anyone. But when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, and you get desperate for God. That's my prayers that God has sent us some desperate folks over yeah. assembly of God. Yeah. I'm talking about one that is one heartbeat away from death. One day away from prison. One day away from jail. One day away from a divorce. One day away from sickness that, 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 that may be indefinite. One day away from losing their mind. One day away from being in the, in the hospital. And when you get somebody like that, you'll be like the units that said, Why well, sit here until we die? Let's get up and go do something. If I'm going to die, I might as well die doing something. I'm not going to sit here and wallow in my misery. I'm going to do something. But don't never think that you're going to touch Jesus without some type of hindrance. Most time is people. But lots of times the devil's using those people. For the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The, the sooner we find out that we're not really wrestling with our spouse, we're not really wrestling with our children, we're not really wrestling with our boss man, we're not really wrestling with our friends, but we're wrestling with enemies in dark places, spiritual wickedness in high places. The enemy can't, the Bible said, the foes be they of your own house. Now, I know sanctified people going to sit there like they don't ever have no issues in their house, and it's all good and great. Come on, brother. Right? But if the truth was known, and we could have a little hidden camera at your house, and we was a fly on the wall, we'd really see what you made of. Yeah. We all wear our sanctified britches on Sunday morning. But then Monday morning when we wake up and we don't have the breakfast like we wanted it, our coffee fixed for us. We want to watch the ball game. They want to watch Hallmark. We tend to lose it just a little bit. We sit there like we dignified and we sanctify. But everybody's honest. They can tell you that sometimes the biggest fight you have is right before you walk in the door on Sunday morning. I don't know why it's like that. And, 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 and I used to be the type of person, you made me mad, I stayed mad at you two weeks. I wasn't going to go start no trouble. I hate fights. I hate arguments. 
If you made me mad and I was doing everything I can to please you and live peace, but you made me mad, you can hang it up. I ain't talking to you for two weeks. I'm pouting. Don't fool with me. And then the Lord called me to preach. You better have your heart right when you step behind here because you're going to need some help. And I'd get angry right before church. I'd be mad if a wet set in the ends and I ain't talking to her no more. That's it. See, she's trying to preach, but I got the microphone. <laughs> her one too. And I'm trying to overshadow because they don't tell her what she's saying. <laughs> and I would have that bitterness in my soul. Some of you know what it's like to be in church and bitter with somebody. Wow. Amen. Wow, and the Lord would knock on my heart's door and say, You're fixing to preach. And I knew immediately what that meant. Because the Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Hold up, it don't stop there. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I know two, I know a story of two old geezers that fought all the time. They were they were two old lovebirds supposed to be, in, but they fought all the time. And they was like me, they like to stay mad at one another for a while when they got to fight. And they knew that scripture, not let the sun go down upon their wrath. So they would stay up to daylight before they went to bed. <laughs> Praise God. Now that's wanting to be mad there, ain't it? I mean, folks, be honest with us. Some of us go around two or three weeks mad over something crazy. And then we think that we're going to get our prayers answered. You want to know why marriages are fought so hard? Because if your marriage is not right, your prayers will be hindered. So the scripture said, I don't know why I'm not married. I, say, I, I, just, I remember when I first got saved, boy, me and my wife were tired. Not fist fighting, but we tired of some big arguments. And I remember a little old five-foot lady, Sister Essie Lassie, went to full gospel Bible said, Her and Brother Joe had been married for 70-something years. I'm like, Wow. She'd walk up, she'd walk up to me. I reckon she knew we had attitudes on us when we walked in the door or something. I know you don't know nobody ever walk in church with an attitude. Do they? We put a smile on, a little makeup, and everything's all fine and dandy. This woman said, she walked up to me, she said, son, hang in there, it gets better. <laughs> I'm like, this woman's a prophet. How do you know what's going on? Just hang in there, son, it gets better. <laughs> And let me tell you something. If I'm gonna listen to someone, I don't want to listen to someone who's been through five husbands. I want to look. I want to listen to one that's been by his side through better for what God has put together. Oh, let me get back to my Bible. Let not man put asunder. Amen. I'll go ahead and finish it. The Bible said that this woman stops Jesus on the way and touches him, presses through all the the people that said you can't touch it. I'm going to tell you right now, when you get ready to touch Jesus, look out. There will be all type of hindrances. Folks will hinder you. People will try to stop you. Doubt will try to stop you. But when you keep thinking about your condition and saying, Preacher, I come to church this morning and I just can't go home the same way I come. If I don't get a touch from Jesus, I'm about to lose my mind. If that's you today, I dare you to give God a praise and do everything in your faith to try to touch him today. And the Bible said that she pressed through and she touched the hem of his garment. Yeah. And when she touches Jesus, stops. And I don't know about y'all, but I can see Jairus right now. Oh, 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 oh don't, don't stop. My daughter's sick. It's an emergency. You know how it is when somebody gets called 911? The person on the, on the phone can't even understand what they're saying. They're such a, come, come, come on, hurry up. He's bleeding. He's dying. His daughter's laying home, dying, and Jesus stops to preach a sermon. Right. Ain't that like preachers? They preaching everywhere they go. They in Longhorn Steakhouse, and all of a sudden they get a sermon. Wow. They're preaching in the steakhouse. Y'all can't even go on a date without preaching. And Jesus stops and he says, who touched me? Some of them are saying, I don't know why, why we're talking about hands today. <laughs> Jesus stopped what he was going to do to talk about the hands. He said, somebody touched me. Wow. And the thing about it is, 
the church folk is supposed to be disciples, soon to be leaders, graduating to ordination. If we get there, we'll talk about that. They asked him a question saying, Lord, there's all kind of people around you. Why are you talking about who touched you? I come to let you in on a secret today. If you really want a real, true moving of God, you're going to have to get out of the norm. Amen. Jesus will pass right by the norm and won't pay you a bit of attention. I know that sounds cruel compared to the preaching you hear on TV, but I'm telling you the truth. If you open up your Bible, Jesus passed right by the norms. But those that went beyond the norm, those that wanted supernatural stuff, they went after God like they wanted supernatural stuff. I just wanted to tell you that because when Jesus was touched by this lady, he stopped and he said, who touched me? And the woman said, it was I. Now that took a lot of boldness because she was supposed to be unclean. She didn't supposed to touch anyone, much less not only the priest, but the high priest. She done slipped up and touched the priest. And now everybody around, and it took a lot of, of strength for Jesus as well to stop this because he don't care what people have to say about him to start with. He don't care about his his swag. He don't care about his rep. He stops and he said, somebody touch me. Now, can't you imagine all the religious people of that day saying, if he knew what type of woman she was. They done said it before. If he knew what type of woman she was, he wouldn't allow her to touch him. And even if he did allow her, he'd have kept walking like nothing happened. But Jesus said, I know I got an emergency call. I got a girl that's burning up with a feet. She's dying. But there's something about this touch that I just received that she was willing to go past the law to find grace. She was willing to go past death to find life. She was willing to go past the obstacles in her way to get a hold of the world. Church, there must be an urgency amongst God's people to get a hold of the Lord. All we can do is sit around and talk about how bad it is. Amen? Do something about it. Amen. She got what she was looking for. Jesus went to Jairus' house. When he arrives at Jairus' house, all the people that are gathered around the house, they begin to tell Jesus it's too late. Let me tell you something. It's never too late for Jesus. I repeat, never too late for Jesus. You're here today and some has counted you out before and said they won't never straighten up. They won't never have a life. But thank God for the ones that carry you into their prayer closet and say, I'm not going to give up on them. The Lord didn't give up on me and I'm not going to give up on them. I'm going to hold on to the horn of the altar until I see something happen. I still believe today that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But the Bible said we're no greater than our master. So Jesus teaches us a principle in Matthew chapter, um, Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter nine, I think Mark chapter five. I'm sorry, Mark chapter five. Jesus teaches us a principle because I believe he could have prayed this prayer of faith with all the doubters, but he didn't. He told them to get out of the house. Watch people you hang around. If they're not edifying you and building you up and you're not leading them to Christ, you better get rid of them. I don't mean to be ugly. I don't mean to be mean and rude. But there's some people that's hung around church for 20 years. They ain't got saved yet. Well, we shouldn't shun them, Brother Brandon. The Bible said that a little leaven, a leaven of the whole lump. Amen. Churches used to be a place of reverence that if people walked in with sin, they sure didn't act like they were saved. They were scared of the Lord. They, they feared the Lord, but not nowadays. They walk in flaunting it. But there's got to be enough of boldness behind the pulpit that if you walk in here and act like a chicken all cocky, you're going to get told about it. Amen. At the pulpit, your sin will get preached upon. Amen. 
most people, they, 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 they get mad and don't come back anyway. Jesus told them to get out of the house. He walked in with his disciples. He walked in with his, his dad, her dad and her parents. And he prayed for the woman. He laid his hands upon the woman. And she rose from the dead. I don't know what else I've got to preach to you this morning. But if you know someone sick along your way. Jesus gives you permission to lay hands upon the sick. And they shall recover. I must move home. But I'm thankful Mr. Marvin's here. He can vouch for this. I first came to pastor this little church. I don't even know if I was a pastor yet. But uh, he brought a fellow with him, and he may remember his name. I can't remember his name right now. But we were having homecoming here, and uh, the evangelists had sweated down and, and left out and at one of the most important times of church to me at the altar call. But he left out. I can understand what he was doing, trying to get some dry clothes on for eating. And uh, right there where Mr. Johnny was sitting, that's where that man was sitting. And when the altar call was given, you know, there's fried chicken, collard greens, and cornbread on that day, and most folks could care less about praying. They got their minds on eating. Yeah. But this man, I could look in his eyes and tell he was sick and he needed a touch. And he got up and he came to the altars and he began to explain his situation. I think he's having some kidney problems, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, this may not even ring a bell with him. It's been years ago. But anyhow, he had some kidney problems and they were talking about dialysis and this, that, and other. And he had some other complication, but we prayed for him. And this man calls me up. I guess Marvin gave me his phone number. Calls me up two or three weeks from then. I was running a revival up at Sister Mary's in Franklin, Alabama. And asked me, could he borrow just a few minutes of the service? And I, I don't really know this, this guy just yet. And I said, well, what, what, what's going on? And he said, I got some papers from my doctor. I went back this weekend. And uh, he said he's smart, but he, he really didn't believe in God. He was a foreign talking guy. So when he walked in, he made his heart sink to his chest. And when he walked in, he looked at his results and his reports and said, your kidneys are not doing good. And he thought he was dying and checking out here. But as the, the conversation went on, he said, I cannot understand it because you only had so, many, so much percentage of your kidneys working. And now they're perfect. I mean, every, every sign of it is perfect. Let me tell you something. When God touches you, he don't do a half job. He does it all all the way. And if he doesn't do it all the way the first time, go back again. Jesus touched one man and he asked him what he saw. He was blind. The man said, I see trees walking. He said, let's pray again. The next prayer, he got to see clearly. Luke chapter 18, Jesus gives this illustration that men ought to always pray and not to faint. He said there was a widow that was being bothered by an adversary or an enemy. And he came to this unjust judge that feared not God, nor did he regard man, and asked the unjust judge to deliver her from her adversary. And he said no, because he didn't care about God. He didn't care about men. But this is Jesus Christ teaching a parable to his children. The Bible said because of her continual coming, she wearied him, and he delivered her of her adversary. And Jesus says, how much more will I deliver my children, which cry day and night unto me? Though I bear long with them, I will deliver them speedily. I can recall a time where I couldn't lay hands upon the sick. I'd be scared they'd get something besides healing. I can recall a time that the apostles couldn't do stuff when they laid their hands upon people. But the answer to your problem is, is don't stop. They kept on following the Lord till the Lord gave them power to heal. Second thing I want to talk about the laying on of hands is just hands of judgment. In Daniel chapter 5, there's a man named Belshazzar. He's a new king of Babylon. He's filled with pride. He's not filled with God. He's filled with pride. He calls over his boys and all of his princes, and they gather around. They have a party. They have a shindig. They're sitting there getting drunk and partying. And all of a sudden, out of the midst of nowhere, God's the last thing on his mind. There went some fingers and a hand writing upon the wall. I don't know about y'all, but he's probably saying, what kind of shrooms did y'all have in this? <laughs> he's seeing stuff. He, he thinks he's hallucinating. And the Bible said that his joints of his loins came unloose and his knees got the buckling. Mm -hmm. 
Children, you better watch out trying to spin your wheels. I know all of us old folks sit around and talk about, well, a kid, teenager, just going to be a teenager. They're going to go out and they're going out and party. Man, I know a lot of teenagers going out and partying. They're in the grave today. Right. They never got a chance to make it right. Come on. And I'm not going to sit here and try to be your best friend and tell you that they're in heaven because of the age of accountability. Friend, that's no scripture I have ever read in the Bible. The Bible said to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. And if you got sin in your life, I'll tell you where they woke up at. They woke up in the pits of hell where the worm died not. The fire's not quenched. I know this is not popular preaching. You wouldn't think that a teenager would go to hell. But I'm telling you, we need to preach for our teenagers. They don't they don't need to sow no bad seed. They don't need to spin their wheel. They need to get saved while they can. Yeah. The world won't accept you. That's all right. It'll be worth it all if you can push through the temptations, Amen. through all the bullying, through all of the unpopular. Kids want to be popular. Amen. Adults want to be popular. But the Bible said that he that loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You got to make your mind up today. You going to love the world, fit in with the world, or you going to be a Christian? You can't do them both. You can't straddle the fence. You can't say I'm living for Jesus in church on Sunday and cussing folks out on Monday. It ain't happening. The Bible says sweet water and bitter water don't come from the same fountain. It's a crying shame. You want to know why people cuss up a storm nowadays? It's not preached behind the pulpits. All they can tell you about is your destiny and how much God wants to bless you and how much God wants to pour out prosperity all over you and your family. And if you sow this $500 seed offer, that God's going to put a hedge of protection around your house. You can't buy the gift of God. It's already been purchased at Calvary by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus said as freely as you've been given, freely you give it. Don't cost you. Don't cost you nothing but the world. You gotta give it up. In Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Miracles and signs and wonders are happening. And all of a sudden, there's a sorcerer and a deputy in that town. Oh, I can't remember exactly right now. I have to go back and look what town they was in. But nevertheless, they was in a town, and this sorcerer heard about the miracles that Paul was doing with his hands. And he came to listen to the word of God with a deputy. But there was another sorcerer by the name of Elamus. The Bible said that came and tried to stop them from hearing the word of God. You know, the devil don't like you leaving his kingdom. He'll do everything he can to stop you before you get a hold of the word of God. And when you get a hold of the word of God, he'll do everything in his power to bring you back to his kingdom. Some of you that just gave your heart to Christ know what I'm talking about. Every day you wake up with struggles. Every day you wake up with the devil on your shoulder saying, come on back. It ain't worth it. It ain't no need going to church. They ain't got nothing down there. You tell the devil he's a liar and tell him to go to hell where he belongs because it's greater as he that's in us. We have the victory in our Lord Jesus Christ. And though I can't see it now, there's something in the view that I can see. The Bible said the elders obtained a good report because they've seen it afar off. You got to see it before you see it. Amen. Amen. You can't look at temporal things. You got to look at eternal things. Amen. And the Bible said when this man came to hinder the word of God, that Paul prayed that God would take care of him. And he said, the hands of the Lord are upon you and struck this dude with blindness. And he stumbled his way back to his house because he couldn't see. And the Bible said that just because that the one sorcerer that was coming, and how I many knows what a sorcerer is? It's magician, soothsayers. And isn't it amazing that we're preaching upon the hands and you see all kind of signs on the side of the road that says, come to Sister So-and-So and she'll read your palms. Tell you everything about your family, what's going on. And you know, I've had church folk to call some of my church folk and tell them that they actually went to this crazy nonsense. I think to myself, what kind of church 
that don't read their Bibles enough to know that that is devilish. You know why a lot of people are leaving God's house? They're seeing the power of the devil work and the church people are saying it ain't nothing too long. Yes, it is something to that. It is real. The power of the devil is real. And when they go and they see these things and the church is saying, it ain't nothing to all that. Well, guess what? They know you lying. Could they just see it? Can these people read your palms? Probably can. Oh, it's quiet now. You see, the devil works signs and wonders. When Moses had, that's, that's what I was talking about start with, when God called Moses, Moses didn't have no confidence. Moses said, what am I going to tell him? And this is what God said. God said, what's in your hand? He looked down, and there was a rod. He said, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground. It turned into a snake. And then he turned around and told him to pick it up. <laughs> Lord, I love you. I want to do your will, but picking up snakes just ain't in my category. But he didn't argue with God. He reached down, and I, I, he picked it up by his tail, though. <laughs> I'm going to tip the Lord. Get that thing up out there. Can't you just see Moses right now? Come on, fella. Come on, fella. Don't you bite me. But when he touched it, it turned back into a rod again. But when he went to perform these miracles in front of Pharaoh, what did Pharaoh have? Pharaoh had some magicians too, didn't he? And they did the same thing. Everything that Moses would do, they said, that ain't nothing. We can do it too. Don't never think that the devil doesn't have power. But I come to tell you the only power he has what God's given him. And we serve the supreme authority that's higher than any other power. Come on, somebody. How many know that God's got all the power? He's all authority. Yeah. And when he says that's enough, yeah. that's it. Can't go no fuck. He can tilt my soul until I scream like a baby. But when God said he's had enough, the devil's got to take his hands off of God's feet. I'm so thankful that I'm in my Father's hand. How many is glad today to be in the Father's hand? He's got the whole world in his hands. God, these people go to these palm readers. The palm readers go predicting their future. They fall in love with them. No. It's a shame. It is. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You better watch out for judgment. If you're living in sin today, you better get it right. Because when God comes back, the way the tree falleth, that shall it lie. The Bible said the axe is laid at the root of every tree. That tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Folks, heaven and hell is something to think about. If you make it, you'll shout throughout eternity. If you don't make it, you'll shout throughout eternity. Think about that. But the ones that do make it will be shouting by the glory of God. The ones that don't make it will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth shouting. You don't never get a chance to go back. Yeah, the devil reminds me sometimes. Look how young you are, boy. You could be out there doing all these type of things all these other 30-something-year-old boys are doing. Now, you know they ain't in church. Most of them ain't in church. Most of them ain't preaching behind the pulpit. Oh, but when I think about my first taste of love, and I'm not talking about women, I'm talking about God. The Bible said, oh, taste of the Lord and see that he's good. One Sunday morning, I got enough of nerves up to get all the sweat off my hands and went to the altars and began to ask God to become Lord and Savior of my life. Boy, what I knew then. If I knew then, but now what I knew then and would have done it a long time ago, I'd have been a whole lot better off. Amen? Amen. I want to make this mention because I'm running out of time this morning. I want to make this mention that the laying on of the hands was also talked about ordination. 2 Timothy 1, 5 through 7. So, and, and I want to make mention of this right here. I, I want to skip that verse and come back to that verse. 1 Timothy 5 and 22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. I often thought that meant when people came around the altar, just don't go and lay hands upon everybody. But that's not what that means. That's an ordination scripture. And I learned that when I got ordained in the sins of God, that our presbytery would, would gather around and, and, and would lay hands upon you and ordain you. But the Bible says, uh, lay hands suddenly on no man. When I came to the sins of God, I, I had got I had got my finger cut a uh, year or so prior to coming to the church and uh, hadn't been filled with the Holy Ghost yet and seeking for the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And 
And I went to this hospital and they charged me three or four thousand dollars for a few stitches and a couple x-rays. And I was like, my Lord, I'd hate to see me get really hurt. And um, but they came up this bill. I didn't have no insurance, and the person I was working for was going to try to help me give me more hours so I could pay for it. And um, lo and behold, we weren't working for them much longer. There I was stuck with this big bill, and I didn't have no whole. I didn't have a whole lot of money at all. And my wife was home, and I was the only one trying to provide for the family. And um, I was given maybe I don't know a few dollars, twenty dollars a month. I think it was twenty-five, something like that. It was something minimum. Everybody told me, don't worry about it. Whatever, whatever you pay, they can't refuse you. Da da this. The next thing I know, a uh, year or so later, I had I had somebody to call me up on the phone. Told me, said, look, your bill has been turned over to the collection agency because you ain't paying enough money. I said, that's all I got. If y'all want to leave me in the collection agency, that's fine. But I'm gonna put food on my family's table before I pay you guys. Okay? Bye. Yep. Say, still talking like that. And but I couldn't. I couldn't afford nothing else. That's all I had. And that wasn't good enough for them, so they turned me over. So don't believe everybody tells you whatever you pay them is good enough because it ain't and don't work, okay? Well, uh, time rocked on, time rocked on. I got to see for the Holy Ghost and this brother stood up in church. He said, well, bless the Lord, if you owe anything, you go back and pay your debt. God, I'll fill you with the Holy Ghost. I'm like, oh, Lord. If I don't need to fill the Holy Ghost, I got to go pay my stitches off. I ain't have no money. I had a burden, but I ain't have no money. And, and so... I felt so bad. You know, some folks in church mean good, but they just don't really know what they're talking about. And so for, for a long time, I didn't think I could get filled with the Holy Ghost because I owed stitches. I owed money for stitches. <laughs> I still saw her after him, but I, I couldn't. I, I knew that brother said he had he stole a tire and he went back and paid that tire and got filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he had scripture. He had scripture to back it up because when Zacchaeus was up on top of the tree, he said... I'll go back and pay everybody that I've done wrong, this, that, and other. But, but, but when he stops that, he don't finish reading the scripture because Jesus said, come down from that tree for today. I'm coming to your house. You see, if we could pay everything that we owed up, Jesus Christ could have stayed at the right hand of the Father and would have never had to come to Calvary's cross because you could have handled on your own. But I thank God for a Savior who came to save me from my sins, not to make me pay them all back myself. Yeah. And so I got I got to the sins of God. I got to, I got to preaching and uh, people coming in like, we want to vote you in. When are you going to get credentials? I'm like, I don't know. I've been through all the courses and I took the test. But maybe they're... Maybe they're checking me out. One of our personal saves kicking the hook, hook caps and checking me out, making sure I was okay, fit to preach. Because nowadays people just want to preach. Yeah. Anyways, the Bible said not to be a novice, and that means one new to the faith. We shouldn't put one new to the faith behind the pulpit. Wow. Amen. Wow. And so I went to our, 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 our uh, secretary treasurer, the one that issued the credential, and I asked him, I said, look here, brother. These people want to vote me in. I ain't got no credential. I done took all your tests. I done done everything, but I ain't got what you told me I could have. And he said, you're not going to get it neither until you pay your debt. So, so what debt? I done forgot about all that stuff. He said, you got some hospital bills that been turned over the collection. Oh, boy, them stitches get me every time. I can't get filled with the Holy Ghost. I can't preach. I got to pay them stitches off. That's bad when a preacher can't even afford stitches, can <laughs> Silver and gold, how do I know? <laughs> Glory to God. I got to praying about that thing because there's a lot of people saying, that's not even for initial stuff that don't matter anyhow. It matters to God. Yes, if it didn't matter to God, he wouldn't have put it in his word. And so I got to pray and I said, Lord, I need some stitches paid off. <laughs> Maybe not exactly that way. I need this debt handled up. And next thing you know, the church began to grow left and right. Finances began to increase, and the stitches got paid off. And I got my credentials. But guess what? I already had the Holy Ghost for any all that stuff take place. Because you don't have to go back and make everything right before God fills you. You need to get filled, then get it right. You got the power now. And before I, I go to my last point, I just want to make mention to show you. How much God looks at ordination when it comes to laying on of hands. About a year into the ministry, I went to school and worked at the same time. The Lord laid upon my heart to give my job up and try to focus upon my studies in the next three years. 
And so I gave up a salary. One of the hardest bridges I've ever had to cross since I've been saved. Gave up a job. Oh, my, I don't like giving up money. The wow. Lord laid it upon my heart. And I've already shared this before and I ain't got time to go back into it. But I had 10000 extra dollars worth of debt that came my way the first, first month. And I made that decision. Here I was giving up my salary and got $10,000 more dollars to pay. I don't know about y'all, but that don't equal up too good. We, we made it from week to week before I stepped off in the ministry full time. And now here it was with, with one salary gone and $10,000 more extra dollars of debt coming in. And you ain't even got what you used to have. And, 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 and so I went into my, 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 my prayer closet that day in the garden. I said, Lord, my hand, my life is in your hands. Literally, my life is in your hands. He said, whose else hands would you want to be? And he came by within a year or so and paid that $10,000 worth of debt. I'm talking about miraculous now. I'm telling you, you have to be there to see it. People would come up to me with envelopes stacked filled with $100 bills. And it wasn't for a new pair of shoes. It wasn't for a new jet airplane. It was to pay my debts off. Come on, so aren't you glad that the Lord will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? But I'm not through yet. I gave up my salary. I'm sitting at home. I'm studying. I'm trying to stay close to the Lord. And all of a sudden, our superintendent calls or texts, and he says, look, Brother Brent, I want you to go on and pursue your ordination. Don't See, you got three levels of, of credentials at the Sinners of God. you got your uh, certificate of ministry, you got your license, and you got your ordination. And I thought, well, I done got my certificate of ministry. They done voted me in what I need ordination for. He said, I really want you to go on and pursue. I said, Brother, I don't, I don't even got a salary. You know, I done gave up a salary, and those books ain't cheap. Those, those, those lessons ain't free. They don't give them away. I wasn't telling him all that because he's my boss, man. But anyhow, I was thinking that. And so I prayed. I said, Lord, if it be your will for me to go on for our own nation, you provide a way for me. Thinking that, all oh, I'm through with all that stuff. I ain't got to worry about going to school no more. Who needs school to preach? And all of a sudden, a family called me up the next week or two. I can't remember how many days it was. And, and, and asked me, said, Brother Brandon, how much it cost to... Finish out your school. I still had a couple, two or three more years to go. I said, I'm not sure. Oh, it don't make no difference. The Lord spoke to me and my wife this morning in our prayer closet. Said we're going to take care of all of it. You ain't got to pay a dime. Yeah. Come on. Don't tell me ordination is not important. And, 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 and the thing about it was that while I was working a job, I was, I was doing it on my lessons online. But now that I wasn't working my job, I was going to these classes and sitting in the classes and getting the, a mentor to teach us these lessons. And the first first class that opened up was in Montgomery, Alabama at the district office. And that was a pretty good little trip back and forth. And when they came over, I invited the family over. We had supper that night. And they all, I got them a total of how many more my books was going to cost us. And they wrote out a check. And after I got to looking, I said, oh, 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 you don't make a mistake. I said, this is, this is more than what my, my, my books are going to be. Oh, they, I, I know it's more than what your book's going to be. We figured we'd give you some gas money and eat money along the way. Yeah. I come to tell somebody today, maybe you're low in your finances, but if you'll be faithful to God and pay your tithes like you're supposed to, yeah. God will make a way where there ain't yeah. no way. He'll bring water out of a rock in the middle of the desert when it don't look like water's available. I come to tell you, if you're drawing from the wrong well, if you'll go to the well of the Lord yeah. Jesus Christ, out of your belly shall flow rivers. Yeah. My last point I want to make today for you religious folks is 12 o'clock. You want to ease on that? Break it, bro. Did you say, folks, to just like being fed? We're going to preach the last little point I got. Yeah. We talked about the hand of judgment. I want to end with the hands of blessing. Because God is a hand of blessing. Amen. Mark chapter six, Mark chapter 10, verse 16. There were some children gathered around. And Jesus took them up in his arms. Put his hands upon them. And blessed them. Amen. We, need to, we need to focus upon that for a moment. Because we got another generation coming. And we don't need to go around talking about what we got. We need to share what we got with the next generation. Amen. Don't never get too busy caught up what God's doing in your life that you don't share it to the next generation that's coming along. In Genesis chapter 48, Jacob passes his blessing down to the next generation. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 12, 
I want to talk about what our hands can do to bless God. We all talk about what God's hands can do to bless us. But how many knows God gave us our, hand to, our hands to bless Him? In Exodus chapter 17, verse 12, Moses is leading God's people. He's finally got into the call of ministry. And, and the Amalekites, Amalek, he's going against the enemies of the children of God. And the Bible said that he lifted up his hands. And as he lifted up his hands, that the Lord prevailed and gave them the victory. But how many knows that after a while, people get tired of lifting up their hands? You want to know why it's quiet in church? People have given up on their praises to God. But I come to remind you that when the church begins to praise God, things begin to happen. I believe the church is losing their praise. But I come to tell you today, 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 7 tells us to stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the laying on of our hands. Preacher, why you act the way you do? I act the way I do trying to stir something up because I believe God's given us the calling by the laying on our hands, but now we got to do something and stir it up. Somebody help me stir it up. Amen. First revival I went to as a young 20-something year old man, them old timers didn't have the ordination like we have today. But I tell you what they did have. They had the goods. Amen. And I remember the first revival service I was ever involved in. The preacher stood up and he says, How many is glad to be in the house of the Lord? Just like I do a lot of times. They began to clap and I thought I would peer beat the blood slap out of my hands before they stopped. The spirit of the Lord fell. Ain't nobody preached. Ain't nobody sung a song. All they were doing was clapping their hands. And the power of God fell in that revival. And I'm telling you, that's why I live the way I do. That's why I believe what I believe. Because I've seen it work. I'm telling you, if people would get off of their high horse and get undignified again and start stirring something other up when they come to church, bless the Lord, we can have church. we got too much pride nowadays. Too much of a proud look. We scared to shout. We scared to sweat. We scared to cry. And that's why God said, I'm going somewhere else where they ain't scared. His hands were heavy. Sometimes the preacher's hands get heavy. Oh, but let me tell you something. They loved their leader. And they knew that as long as the preacher had his hands up, that they won the battle. And the Bible said that her, Aaron and her, I think was their names, went over there and propped him up a stone where he could sit on. And when they did that, one got under one arm, one got under the other arm. And said, brother, when you're too weak to hold your hands up, I'm going to hold them up for you. Amen. I praise God for all the people God has blessed me with an Oak Grove Assembly of God. That when I walked through the fire and didn't feel like preaching, I had somebody stirring it up, hold my hands up. It ain't all times that I feel good in the Lord, but when you're here helping stir it up, something can happen. Amen. 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 Whatever we do, church, we don't need to lose the victory. Amen. People are not coming. To church, but there's no victory. Why would they? Listen to the scriptures. I hope you have a different out outlook on church when you leave here today. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12. Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down. Church, we've let our hands fall. I was a big wrestling fan when I was a little boy and I used to love what Hulk Hogan. I know all that stuff was fake. Hulk Hogan, I was going to say that. Anyhow. Somebody get the beating the tar out of him and he'd lay on that ground. At that time they'd hold his hands up. They'd fall down. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And that referee rear back, hold his hand and they'd fall down. And if it fell down the third time, he was out. That old hand go up like it always did, and right before it hit the ground. Where'd the hope tomorrow? Where'd the brother at? <laughs> <laughs> he go to shake that hand, brother. And it's like he had, it isn't like a power god hit him, so he fly up on that mat, and he was fishing a body slam. I didn't care if it was 550 pound Andre the Giant. He finna pick him up and throw him through the, through the mat. Come on. 
I wish the church, besides lifting those hands down, I believe the church needs to lift those hands up again. All we talk about how bad it is. Church, we're, we're on the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to get warmed up. We need to get ready. We've got to get ready. Amen. Why do I come to church, Brother Stone, so all we back there clapping? <coughs> I'm glad you asked. Psalm 47, 1 says, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Amen. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. sit down and shut up and don't move. But she didn't, she didn't know everything. She was just taught what great-grandma taught her. Right. But we need to quit going by what great-grandma taught if great-grandma wasn't going by the Word of God. Right. Amen? The Bible says, clap your hands, all ye people. Yeah. Amen. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. We need some racket in the house. Let's bow our heads today.